Good morning. Good morning. I'll wait. I'll wait for you to sit too. Okay. Sorry, didn't mean to call Just you. Just in up. case. So before I start, before I start, I want to make mention. So last night I was talking to my mom on the phone, who is yet to come see a chapel um, that I've given and really wanted to be here, but couldn't because she's not um, in good health today. So I promised my mom that I would try to capture just some part of the experience or, or part of the moment, and so I'm wondering if you could all indulge me and help me for a moment. So what I'd like to do is take a picture and text it to her. She probably won't be able to open it on the iPhone that we got her, but that's all right. Okay, can you all smile, no, no inappropriate gestures. It actually, I can't, I can't get everybody in. Do you have that picture that you could show? <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, it's, that's kind of a tough one. All right, that's good, Russ. We don't need that. Okay. So on our Europe trip, when I went with the orchestra, um, there were selfie stick vendors probably every, felt like every 10 feet, and they would sort of put these up in your face and try to make you buy them. Some people on the trip probably remember that. Um, my son and I were walking to get some food and walked by one guy who was just like right right in the face and no, no thanks. And then we turned around because we were going the wrong way and like about 10 seconds later, there he was again and he was like doing this and it's like almost like the, the Jedi mind tricks kind of thing. Like this is the selfie stick that you're looking for. Um, so I, I of course wanted to kind of beat him off with one. If it had been shaped like a lightsaber, I might have bought one. But when I first saw this thing, I kind of thought that it was at the height of being ridiculous. Um, if in, in my worst moments that like, you know, it's one step closer to the apocalypse. Have we as a society grown so unbelievably self-absorbed that we not only spend so much time taking selfies, but we fashion these tools, these sort of odd narcissistic prosthetics that extend from our bodies so that we can capture just the right moment or right angle of ourselves as we're standing in front of the Eiffel Tower or in Times Square or these less auspicious moments like you know, sitting on our couches eating nachos or waiting at a bus stop or something like that. Mrs. Fortunato and I were just in the city last week and uh, we saw some guy take out a selfie stick and extend it all the way um, and block everybody from walking past. And, you know, she uh, turned to me and said, that's quite a tool, to which I responded, he is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go past that one. Um, back in November, back in November, Time Magazine said that the selfie stick was one of the greatest inventions of 2014. So when I read this, you know, there's that little part of my soul that started to die that was crying out, you know, is this what we've become? This thin metal pole that sort of reminds me of the broken antenna on my Dad's old 1978 Datsun, and for those of you who don't know a Datsun, think sort of a maybe less cool version of a Corolla back in the 70s. How is this one of the greatest creations of, of 2014? I mentioned it to a colleague, 
And I was expecting to get some kind of affirmation of like, yeah, you're right. And his response was, well, in fairness, you know, they now have ones with Bluetooth. Like, how cool is that? And I just had to look away. So clearly I came at this sort of selfie stick thing with a, with a bias, if you can't tell. Um, by the way, if you haven't heard, there's a whole lot of controversy, weirdly enough, swarming around selfie sticks, and obviously the name of this in itself sort of lends itself to those who are partial to tasteless jokes. Um, are these things making our lives better? Are they the scourge of the planet, as was written in one article? There's this headline detailing how some tourist sites were banning selfie sticks because they, I want to get this words correctly, because of their significant potential for dangerousness. Uh, in fact, the science ministry of one country now has declared that retailers could face a fine of up to $27,000 or three years in jail for selling untested versions of what they call, and it only gets better, the handheld monopod. So you can see, by the way, why the selfie stick was probably what won out in the product naming as opposed to handheld monopod. All of this talk of danger and prison time does seem all a little bit too much when you consider the fact that we live in a world where really difficult and challenging things are happening, where it's an age of ISIS and global warming and immigration battles and income inequality, and it feels quite out of whack to be giving this thing so much airtime or power. And yet, here I am. Why am I talking about this, and why should any of us care about this at all? About something that simply may just have its 15 minutes and wind up at the bottom of a drawer, next to an iPod shuffle or silly bands or something with angry birds on it or something that's going to wind up being you know, a fad from the recent past. So I wonder when I look at this or any other fad or piece of technology, I wonder what does it mean for us? What does it say about us? But most importantly, I ask the question, you know, what do we want? There's often this thin line between taking control and using our tools or our technology to improve the lives we want to lead and then losing control of the tools that use us and overtake our lives without our really knowing it. There was an article recently in which an author purported to share a great benefit of the selfie stick. Turns out he said some people are so pleased with the advent of this because they no longer have to walk up to a stranger to ask him or her to take a picture of them or their family. And to that I respond, yeah, what a shame. Um, I'll be the first to admit, I do not like asking other people to take pictures of me or my kids or my family. Mrs. Fortunato often gives me a dirty look when she says, you should go ask them, and I say I don't want to. I often refuse from the beginning, but then relent and give into it. I don't love asking people to do that, but then I still think and still wonder, is it better to not ask? Is it, I mean, we live in this world right now where we often tend to be pretty disconnected from one another and from the people walking around us sometimes. Same thing last week in New York City. We were um, in, in a restaurant or in uh, this sort of self-service uh, food place, and there was a woman who walked in with these big Beats headphones on. She was scrolling on her Samsung Galaxy. She was buying a prepackaged sandwich in a self-checkout lane at this kind of grab-and-go place. And don't get me wrong, I actually do appreciate experiences where I can get things done and don't necessarily have to talk to everyone around me while I'm doing them. But I kind of looked at her and I kind of wondered, should this make me sad? Is this a sign of the times? Is this really about being disconnected and alone? Maybe this woman has lots of friends out there uh, in her life and just needs a break from talking or interacting. But maybe not. Maybe she's always like this. Regardless, does she need to have, uh, does she, can she not have room in her life for the serendipitous meetings with strangers or acquaintances or even friends that you run into, those meetings that often add a lot to your lives. Sometimes they even can change your lives. This is part of the reason why we talk to you and ask you to uh, not lose yourself in your headphones or your phones when you're walking around on this campus or in the dining hall. I, you know, I know sometimes it would be easier for us to let that go. I don't want you to miss out, though, on the conversations, on the encounters, on the connections that happen when things are not planned. Um, things that could simply brighten your day or, again, maybe change the path of where you're going. If we live so much of our lives behind a screen, or always in a self-checkout lane, whether it's literally or metaphorically, it's bound to do something to us, and something I'm not sure I want for you or for me. Um, something that perhaps makes us feel too regularly alone, feeling separate or other, and ultimately doesn't really serve us well. I have to add one more note about the story about the woman with the headphones. So she was pretty wrapped up in what she was listening to and what she was doing on the phone. She went to exit the store, um, and she you know, put her hand out on the glass to leave. Didn't move. 
She pushed it again. She was still doing this and not paying attention. She pushed it again. I started getting agitated watching it, agitated watching it. The third time, she's like, doing this. And it's like, why wouldn't it move? Because it was a window. <laughs> so she started to push for the fourth time, and I just couldn't help it. And I kind of banged on the table, I'm like, it's a window. <laughs> Finally, someone from the other from the door, which was next to it, which looked very similar to the window, um, happened to open the door, and she kind of like barely looked up and she walked out. And I said to Mrs. Fortunato, "There's, I feel like we've witnessed something almost allegorical here." Um, and I was trying to think of something remotely clever to say to finish that part of the story, but I instead happened to recall a quote from Alexander Graham Bell: um, "When one door closes, another opens." But we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the one which is opened for us. You know what's worse, though? If you don't even notice whether there's a door in front of you in the first place. <laughs> so another thought's crossed my mind as I pondered the value of the handheld monopod. As with any piece of tech or tool, just because you have it doesn't mean you need to use it. I think about this when it comes to taking pictures and the immediacy of how we all feel compelled to publish our pictures, share our videos so frequently. It's amazing that we can do this and live at a time when video and pictures, uh, I know this is the way we communicate, it's important, it connects us a great deal. But I imagine many of us have discovered, whether through our own experiences or watching those of others, you know, not everything needs to be tweeted or texted or Snapchatted, which I'm not sure it's a word, but it doesn't need to be broadcast. Nor do we have to feel like we're missing something by exercising some editorial control or taking some uh, time before we post the things that are going on in our daily lives moments to moment. Our world may in fact be a little bit better with a couple few burn book posts or pictures that are out there. You know, I think more importantly, or most importantly, though I like taking pictures or videos to remember events and moments, thinking about this has also reminded me it's sometimes more fulfilling to focus on those moments, on living moments, than actually worrying about capturing them and recording every single one of them and figuring out exactly how to share them with the world. Sometimes we can get so wrapped up in how the moment is going to look or be perceived after the fact that we actually miss out on the very thing that matters most, the actual moment, the experience, and the people. I feel that happens a lot when it comes to the sometimes obsessive concerns people have with wedding photos or prom pictures. Hopefully none of you, um, when it comes to May 19th, will be focusing more on the prom pictures or the prom Snapchats than actually enjoying the prom and spending time with your date. As I can tell you from personal experience, the picture is really never that much worth it. Um, this is probably a very bad thing to do. Raz, do you want to put up the right picture? I don't know if it's in the right order. Next one. So, I can tell you, the picture most assuredly is not worth it. Um, and just be glad that you did not grow up in the 1980s. Okay, please put that one away. Alright, one thing I've learned in my life though, with all that I've said about selfie sticks today is that life rarely lives in absolutes. So I must admit, as I was thinking about this last night preparing this talk, I found myself thinking strangely there may be actually some good to this selfie stick. When I was on the orchestra trip, I noticed actually some of the differences between the experiences of people taking selfies with and without the stick. The extra foot or two of extension accomplished something more positive than I had actually really surmised. It offered a different perspective when capturing a moment. It offered a different angle and allow people to capture more in the background and more context than you probably could do just by extending your arm. It opened up a broader field of vision and put the subject of the photo in a larger and fuller context of place, and in many instances in the context of other people who could now fit in the picture. But it was true that with the use of this tool, suddenly there was one, where there was one, there now could be a group, a group of faces. And you could catch the faces in the context of a beautiful sunset, or in the shadow of an historic monument. The thing that I was feeling somewhat rather snarky and dismissive about and to begin with, I do have to admit, it captured a moment, perhaps a really special moment, in a way that might otherwise not have happened. And by opening up the frame to include more than just one face, there were some moments when this selfie stick could help memorialize a friendship 
and create a visual record of the self in relation to surroundings and to places and experiences that actually really matter to people. So I got to thinking, I don't plan to walk around campus with the selfie stick because as you know, it's quite dangerous. Um, I was thinking hypothetically though, what would I want in my selfie stick backgrounds? What backgrounds or context would I like to connect myself to that would make these pictures worth keeping to me? So is it me in front of the arch, or in front of the magnolia tree, or in front of Sharp House? I mean, those would be the obvious ones, but I'm not really a scenery, monument, building kind of person. I think I'd actually rather like to capture myself in relation to the people that I admire here, the special experiences that I'm proud to be a part of, or even just witness on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe ones that aren't so public, that are not talked about at school meeting all the time, or on a website, or in a leadership story, though even maybe they should be. So in my hypothetical selfie stick picture backgrounds, I'd like to be reminded of how fortunate I am to be part of this place and for the great stuff that happens around me. I wouldn't just want a building. I'd want Mrs. Conforti at her dining room table with the prefects, working on thank you notes to all the faculty and staff. I'd want Helen Mercedes bringing us to tears with her MLK Day words on this stage at school meeting. I'd want Mr. Moore rocking the corduroy suit in the only way only that he can coming to me and asking me about how to get more City Squash kids to play. I'd want Willie Kaiser smiling and being kind to just about everybody he meets every day. I'd want Mr. Mazza opening up his apartment every Sunday for cinnamon buns, and Mr. Pagato elevating the awkward call out to an art forum, <laughs> always trying as hard as he can to be funny and often succeeding, which is a very hard thing to do. I'd want, I'd want Coach Antonelli and the wrestling team fighting through injury and adversity and never giving up this year. The flight deck boys, at, uh, and you saw that picture which was out of order, uh, at Sharp House dressing up in my daughter's costumes to entertain her, although I think they just liked wearing them. <laughs> I'd like Mr. and Mrs. Devaney making South Cottage into a home, Mr. Mantegna yelling with confidence and love for his team on the sidelines. I'd like Luke and Elijah having the really coolest conversation on this stage, the Evanses, the, Ryans, the Ryersons, Raz, Ms. McMillan, all those who were here probably after your bedtime making sure the plays happened the way they needed to. Mackenzie Belton planning the St. Jude strip. Mr. Hurtado setting a new standard for faculty chapels. Sarah Field blowing me away with her lead tribute speech. Shoshana Geller picking up her brother's legacy for Family Fun Day. Mrs. Gerson coaching everyone, everyone, through their leadership story. And Dr. Miller standing off to the side of a room after 30 plus years moderating skeptics, embodying the living spirit of this place. And then there's the picture I took of all of you in this place. These are the pictures that I want to be in. So maybe this wonderful contraption is not as bad as I once thought, though I won't be tooling around campus with it anytime soon. If nothing else, it, gives me, it gave me an opportunity to think about different and changing perspectives and how one little infernal piece of metal, it can be symbolic or complicit in helping us gain some perspective and at times losing some. I suppose some of the reasons that I became so interested in talking about this thing, or for that matter selfies, or any technology or tools that focus on the self was because I was wondering, does it take away, or does it add, does it help, or does it hurt you, me, anyone, from being true to ourselves? I suppose my conclusion is one that I have to come to about any piece of tech or tool that enters or invades our lives. Sometimes they serve us and sometimes they do us a disservice, so best to make enough time and enough room in our lives to help figure out who and what's important to us. Who and what do we want in our pictures? And I think if you do that, I'm pretty sure you won't end up on the short end of this or any other stick. Seniors first.